So what we did is we had a closer look at uh, the singularity issue and we asked you to check the calculation at least one person had because he came up with the fact that it is not ready today, I mean with the error. And we pointed out that uh, when we are dealing with uh, this axis being uh, 0 degrees that uh, when this axis and then the this rotation axis they line up together there is a temporary loss of degrees of freedom. And what I ended with is saying that we will usually retain the value of theta 4 and we will just change theta 6 when we encounter a situation that theta 5 is equal to 0. So, this is where we had left. So, what we do then is that we come back to theta 4 and <coughs> so we obviously have the solution that uh, theta 4 is a tan 2 f 2 a minus f 1 a if theta 5 is greater than 0 and is a tan 2 f 2 a minus f 1 a plus pi if theta 5 is less than 0. Now, this will not be implementable because theta 5 is not known, right. So, <coughs> but what you, if you look closely, if you have a rotation about this axis which differs by 2 rotation will differ by pi, what will it do? It will align this theta 5 axis either upward or downwards, exactly opposite directions right that is all it does. So, they are anti parallel to each other for the rest of it does not matter. So, what would happen is if you set theta 5 into upward direction then theta 5 would measure about there if you send it downwards theta 5 will rotate a positive theta 5 will rotate it in the opposite direction, but you can essentially get the same motion out of the whole system by rotating in opposite sense also. So, in a, so really does not matter. So, what we do is we select that S 5 and hence theta 5 it is always positive. Okay. So, if you do that then life becomes very easy then uh, cosine of 5 is F 3 A and S 5 is equal to F 2 A minus S 4 uh, minus sine of theta 4. So, theta 5 then becomes A tan 2 and we have this term in here. So, we have everything under control. So, now <coughs> we note that this then gives us two sets of solutions actually, okay. one with theta 5 being uh, positive or negative. We could also have assumed theta 5 to be negative, so that will give you another set of solutions. Okay. And simultaneously it makes also sense to design not to design the joint to have a full rotation because to get full rotation you need more hardware. If you are only rotating it about a limited segment then life is much easier. Okay. So, full rotation creates special problems especially you know then you have to take wires ahead of it and things like that. So, wires will rotate fully and you can turn the wires round and round. So, you take care of all these issues. So, it is better that you could save on hardware cost and you limit the fifth axis rotation to about 210 degrees. So, 180 is the theoretical limit. Now, usually you will have some hardware error. So, you just push it beyond that 15 degrees on both sides. So, limit it to about 210 degrees and then you use only the set of solution which is permissible. But strictly theoretically both these solutions are admissible. So, if you have done this, <coughs> excuse me. So, finally, you will end up with uh, the last axis which is actually quite easy because you can just go back and see that C 6 you have expression like this, S 6 you have expression like this. So, um, theta 6 then becomes eta and 2 S 6 C 6. Okay. So, it is now, this technique is not unique to the Stanford arm, you can use it for most commercial manipulators and uh, so as you have seen there are small traps and pitfalls, especially relating to number of solutions, uniqueness of solutions and things like that. Make sure 
you are reducing it to the least number of possible solutions. And sometimes, uh, but essentially this is this method that we have used it works because the transformation matrices which we have for the Stanford manipulator and for most industrial manipulators, they have several zero entries, okay. Zero entries and one is 90 degrees, so either cosine of alpha or sine of alpha will become zero and one will become, the other one will become one. Similarly for some of the A's are zeros, some of the D's are zeros, so life is easier. And for a general manipulator with uh, non-zero DH parameters, this method may not work. In fact, like I told you the other day, that they use different methods. You know, you have to form, uh, well, you form similar matrices, but then you can create what are called orthogonal uh, matrices. So that's, there's a lot of theory of algebra which you don't study, especially relating to polynomial matrices developed roughly between uh, 1890 and 1920. Um, if you go to a uh, old university, right, so IIT for example is a kid university, right, we are 50 years old, celebrating golden jubilee. How old is Cambridge? Oxford, Yale, Harvard. Any idea? 700 years. 700 years old. What about Yale? 200. 200. Okay. Do you know who Andrew Yale was? Hmm? So he was somebody who was there with the East India Company. So he had looted so much money from India that <laughs> he had enough money to form found a university there. So it's roughly about 400, 400 now 450, 500 years old. So we are Bacha universities, right, IIT. So if somebody ever asks you, you know, what is IIT produced, I said, still growing, right? We are still growing. Anyway, so if you go to a really old university, you know, they will have libraries and there are some uh, really great books which you can read. It's difficult to read them now because the language is very weird, but the math is still the same. And they deal with, you know, problems which uh, are literally problems which you can ask in JE. So they are solvable from the basics, but it needs a lot of uh, mental agility to, you know, do these manipulations. Uh, like you will see in the next segment when I cover the next lecture. So anyway, so finally for Stanford arm, we landed up with four solutions, All right, the two shoulder ones and then the issue with the theta, theta 5. So if you take the Puma 560, the son of the robot for which you'll find data in the net, you'll find eight, inverse, eight, eight solutions in inverse kinematics. So that was the beauty of uh, the Stanford arm, that uh, when it was designed, they designed it so that the number of solutions reduced. So they don't have to deal with uh, you know, trapping for these cases and making sure it goes to the right place. And then when, with that arm design, you're down to two solutions, only elbow up and elbow down, which is a very quick determination. So all of this goes into the design of a manipulator. Okay, so all this theory. So move to a new topic. We look at general motion in space. Okay, now. So what we've figured out is how to, if you, if I know, how to, where to place the arm in terms of a transformation matrix. So we figured out how we can figure out how, what each joint should do. And the other way around also we know that if I know what each joint, where each joint is at, then I'll know where the end is also. So I know this. Now we look at the problem of deciding or how to figure out things in space. So life is a little difficult in space. So we start by, well, translation is fairly simple and you've been dealing with it for a long time and you should know this theorem by Euler, okay, that any displacement of a body in which one point remains fixed is uh, equivalent to rotation about a unique axis passing through that point, okay. 
You've seen this theorem before, right? Yes, no. No? Not in this form. It seems intuitive. It is not intuitive to human beings for several thousands of years <laughs> until Euler came. And then even more important is Casal's theorem, which is further generalization, which says that uh, any spatial displacement of a body except a pure translation is equivalent to a rotation about a unique line combined with a translation parallel to the line. Right? Difficult, right? But essentially it's a screw. Right? A point on the screw rotates about the axis and then also translates about the axis and the translation is related to the pitch and the rotation. Okay. So we will look at screws later. And I mean that, but this is so essentially what Casal is talking about is what is called a screw motion. So that is the general motion in space. So if you start from with the coordinate system somewhere here and then you move it here. Now if I am just looking at these two end position, that can be described as a single rotation about a screw. So today's deal is to find out that if I am given two coordinate systems, well I should should never use the right and the left hand together. So if I'm given a coordinate system here and a coordinate system here, then um, how do I find the unique axis and the unique screw? And these two, uh, Casal's theorem and Euler's theorem are related in the sense that, so there is definitely a rotation of the axis. Now the rotation axis for Casal and Euler is the same, right? So the added task that we have to do for finding out the screw is that in the first case you have a fixed point. So you know the rotation is about that point. In this case, now even if I have this coordinate system here and the other one here, I know the direction of rotation, right? But I do not know whether I want to rotate about now if I have a direction. I can place it here, 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 here at different points in the space. Now if I place the rotation axis here and I have the point here and I rotate by say 90 degrees then this will go up here, right? But if it is this, if I rotate by 90 degrees it will only go here. So the placement of the rotation axis is also important and for Euler you simple man, so he said, okay, I just deal with when the point is fixed, Casal extended it and we have this uh, theorem. <coughs> so before we uh, <coughs> get to the screws and the axis and things like that, there is a very simple thing which you, there in most books, just reproduce here for completeness. Um, if you have a rotation about axis k by amount theta, the resulting transformation matrix is given here. And you can see there is a lot of symmetry here. So this is say k square v theta. Oh, v theta by the way is, so that's 1 minus cos theta. Okay, it's written as v theta. Did anybody look it up? Nobody looked it up in Wikipedia. Some of you did. Not in Wikipedia. No, where? Just Google search. Just Google search. Yeah, I should do it. You know Wikipedia is not working today, right? Yes, sir. So anyway, so it's good I didn't try and prepare notes today. I have, yesterday night I put in something from Wikipedia, cut paste and oh, that's nice. So I did it yesterday. That's why I knew that uh, they're shutting it down. How many of you have contributed to Wikipedia? Money? You just put material? No? Money? No? Money. Okay. You should give 100 bucks at least. It's useful, right? So anyway, so the all the diagonal elements, we have this one, we have this one, and we have this one. So they are very similar. Okay, just x, y, z, and you can see it's x, y, z axis, so it's there. You look at this term and this term. They are very similar except for this sign. So it's not a very bad matrix, it can be remembered. 
So this gives me the matrix for rotation about a particular axis by amount theta. So if you here and then rotate, take this coordinate system, rotate about axis by theta, you get a new axis. And just a 3 by 3 matrix, there is no translation. So this is useful if you have determined that, okay, I want the end effector to go from here, I want to rotate the end effector and I want to control how quickly it does it. Suppose I want to rotate over uh, 2 minutes or so, 2 minutes is too much, 5 seconds. Now if you just let the robot do it, it might do it very fast. It might just do this. So you want to do this slowly, then you have to give it intermediate positions. So if you have determined the axis, that this is the axis of rotation that I want, then you can chop up the angle into smaller bits and then give commands. So you can give successive, so you can generate these, this matrix successively for the sixth frame and then the robot will move slowly. Okay. Now you note that if you do not do that and you just tell the robot move over 6 seconds, what typically a manipulator will do is that it will chop up the angular movements required at the joint level into small parts which may not be a continuous rotation about the axis that you are interested in. Okay, so the two different things. Okay. So if you want the end effect to rotate continuously about an axis, it does not mean that all the joints rotate at a uniform rate. Okay, so there is a, we will figure out once you work on these problems in the lab. So this matrix is useful to work with that and once we have extricated the k and the theta, the direction rotation theta, then we can use this quite effectively to work on the problem. So now we will start looking for the magical axis. Okay. And <coughs> so we will keep it simple first, we will change from the identity matrix to a target matrix. And now we are dealing only with the rotation part, so 3 by 3 is fine. Okay, and later on we will just generalize it, so that we do not need to start with identity matrix, we can start from any matrix and go to another matrix. Can somebody already guess how I will do that? No, well that will just make it 4 by 4, but otherwise I can, irrespective of which matrix is given to me, if I describe everything in that matrix, right, then that matrix becomes the identity matrix, right. So I'll do that. I'll just transform everything, put it on that on that frame, and then do all my calculations. And once I've calculated everything, I'll just transform the frame back. Because the rotation theta will not change, and I can always change the axis by using the transformation matrix. So this is not a. All I want to point out is that if I when I derive from identity <coughs> matrix to another matrix, I'm not losing any generality. I can always handle this down the line. Now, <clears throat> it's nice to have Euler around who tells me that when I'm going from this frame uh, xa, ya, za to xa, yb, zb, there is an axis about which it's a single rotation, theta. So I'm not stupid to look for it. Okay, so I start looking for it and I will say okay, there is some coordinate frame which has its z axis along that zc which is the Euler axis. And so the rotation is by theta about that zc axis. So now we understand that if frames a and b are expressed in the c frame, then rotation z comma theta will take frame A to frame B. Right, very simple. And we have taken frame A to be expressed in itself, so that is a unity matrix. And we take T as a transformation from the base frame to C, that is from A to C. Okay. So if T is a transformation A to C, then C is represented by the same transformation T right that's what we agreed on when we did transformations that if there's an operation if there's a matrix which moves 
A to C, then C is represented by the same matrix, 4 by 4 matrix, isn't it? We said the identical things. No, not getting this. When we, when we did the transformations, we took a matrix and we said that this matrix is really nice. Right? What are the many things it does? It transforms points which are given in one coordinate frame into another coordinate frame. And we said the same matrix also represents this frame in this frame. And the same matrix also transforms frames. Right? We said there are the three magical properties which it has which are really exceptional. So here I am using the same, I am explicitly stating the same thing that if T is the transformation which moves the base frame to C, then the description of C in A is the same T. Okay. So now we want to do rotation Z comma theta about the same frame. So we do a post multiplication. Okay. But then I want to move it back to the base frame. So multiply by T inverse. Okay. So we get T times rotation Z comma theta and then into T inverse. Right. So what did I do? I went to that frame C, rotated, move back to the base frame again. And now this is the now this should have given me the matrix M. So this is my statement. So the matrix M is equal to T times rotation Z comma theta times T inverse. Now when you get an equation like this, you call the matrix M to be similar to this matrix. So when you have this T and T inverse multiplying a matrix, then you say this matrix and this matrix are similar. Now that is a technical term in linear, in linear algebra and uh, so this is the part which I took out from Wikipedia. It says 2 n by n matrices A and B are called similar if for some invertible n by n matrix P, similar matrix represents the same linear transformation. So this is interesting. But anyway, so this is a property. And similar matrices, they represent the same linear transformation under two different bases. Okay. Now, this is American, in English you would write it as basis, B A S I S, but anyway, the same thing. So, if, uh, <coughs> if this is the situation, okay, then the traces of the two matrices are the same. Now, what is the trace of a matrix? some of the diagonal elements. So after all this, life is very simple. Okay. So all you need to know is what is rotation about Z about theta, it is C theta, C theta. The trace is C, C, C theta plus C theta plus 1, right? which is 2 C theta plus 1 and the trace of the other matrix is obviously M11 plus M22 plus M33. Right? So, you get a very simple equation in the end that cosine of the rotation theta is equal to m11 plus m22 plus m33 minus 1 divided by 2. Okay. Is this intuitive? No? What? This is not intuitive. <laughs> so, actually, this was done before the statement. So, just to show you that it cannot be that intuitive. Okay, so we know the amount of rotation that we have to do about the Euler axis, but we still do not know the axis. So to do that, we have a very interesting property that if you rotate that particular axis, right, and you rotate it about, uh, and then that axis will not change because you are rotating about that axis. So we will try to use that property. So if my axis is given by W, this is a vector, so I have written it as W. I should have written it as W with a tilde below or a cap on top, but life stuff <laughs> sometimes. Anyway, so, so even if I multiply by the matrix which transforms this, so now that 
So this w vector will still stay the same. It will not change because it is the same in both the matrices, uh, both the coordinate frames. So we just buffer this, we multiply this by the identity matrix, okay, which does not change anything. Only thing is that it allows me to write it in this form as the matrix M minus the 3 by 3 identity matrix times W is equal to 0. We take this equation, multiply it by M transpose. So M transpose W is equal to M transpose times M which is the identity matrix okay. and the transpose because the 3 by 3 matrix is orthonormal. So this is a known phenomenon. So then you get M transpose minus identity matrix times W is equal to 0. Subtract this equation and this equation and you get it in this form M minus M transpose times W is equal to 0. So you get a nice matrix equation like this. M minus M that is why you get terms like M12 minus M21. Okay. Okay. So, we should be able to solve this equation to find W1, W2 and W3. Yes, no? Yes. How do you solve it? Hmm? Eigenvalue problem. I am no, no, solving for W1, W2, W3, the three elements of the W, the directions. How do you solve this? Three equations, three unknowns. Can you do you always have a solution? Huh? No? When when don't you have a solution? Yeah, what is the determinant in this case? Huh? What is the value of the determinant? Zero. Okay, so there is linear dependency in there and plus there are other interesting thing, there better be linear dependency otherwise we will be in trouble. Why? Because by definition we want, we have a inbuilt equation right, which is W1 square plus W2 square plus W3 square is equal to 1. So we have a problem, but anyway. So. <coughs> You take any two of the equations, okay, third equation dependent, so we are ignoring it and you can solve and you get a W prime, not the W I am interested which is normalized, but a W prime which is in this form, okay. Now what I have to do is to, I have to normalize this so that this becomes normalized and you have this brilliant expression. Once normalized, it becomes even simpler m23 minus m32, m31 minus. Now, this is easy to remember, right? This is the x. So, you forget the first, second, and the third, and then minus 32, and then this is y. So, third followed by the first. So, it is very easy to remember, right? The only problem is the proof of this, right, coming from the previous step runs into a couple of pages, right? And it is just. Uh, a very uh, long drawn out algebraic procedure to find out that this actually turns out to be sigma upon 2 sin theta where sigma is equal to plus minus 1, okay. And now you get theta because theta is intimately related to uh, uh, m11. So see what is theta dependent on? m11, m22 and m33. Now you know that they do not occur in this equation. So where do you think the sin theta comes from? It did not occur to you that you should question where is sin theta coming from. See in this. 1, 1, 2, 2, 3, 3 is not there, right? So when I normalize this, where does sin theta come from? Equation traces, we have sin, we have 
we have theta, yes. But 1, 1, 2, 2 and 3, 3 do not occur in this area, right? So, in normalizing it, where did it come from? Come on, you should be able to answer this. But if you know one, if you know 1, 2 and 1, 3, then you know 1, 1, right? Because each row is normal, right? Square of that plus square of 1, 1 will give you equal to 1. So, it comes in. So, it is a difficult derivation. But there is a reason why it comes in there. So, finally, you get this uh, term coming in here and derivation runs into a couple of pages. So, it should, you should be able to find it. It is called, it's called Rodriguez formula or something, Rodriguez formula. I should have written it down here. No, let me try writing it down here. So, then you land up with, oh, sigma is plus or minus 1 because there is still uncertainty about which rotation that you want to go to. And so, you can find out both the rotation and the axis. Okay. And then we come to this point. So, as to how you handle the general frame transformation from A to B. And <coughs> so, it is very simple. You represent frame B in frame A, find theta and W just convert back to the base frame. So, then you can use all of this method. So, clear so far? Okay. And also the things are not very simple. Some of the derivations are, the end use is very simple, which is typical of robotics. You know, you use robots out on the floor, out in the industry, right? You do not do anything, right? It does its work. But the undergoing work and mathematics is actually quite intricate. And so that is what you do when, in, when you actually do robotics in real life. But when you do schools, you know, you do not do any of the mathematics. You do everything but that, you know, school, school robotics pro projects. And so you just build something and you program something, it moves around, jumps around. So it is a bit different than when you want to use it in real life to do something useful. Then you pump in, you know, a great amount of knowledge and then, you know, when you see it in the end, you know, it is just so easy. You are just, you know, picking up something, putting it there, picking it, putting it there, welding, painting. So, anyway, so <coughs> now we get to finite screws, which is uh, simultaneous rotation plus translation. Now, <coughs> So, I take this axis here, initial axis, I need to rotate it, get it to this final axis form. Okay. And so, there is a direction of rotation. Okay, now, Zc we have determined what is the axis. But I have to locate this axis, and the way you locate this axis is by identifying a vector which goes from this original axis or some frame which tells you where this which is a normal to this axis. Okay. So, irrespective of which frame I am talking about there is always a point and from a point to a line there is always a unique normal. So, you call that normal rho n. So, that is a property of this line in space. So, I have to find that rho n, but Z c we already know how to find given the matrix and then I have to find theta which is the amount of rotation about Z c and I have to find this d which is the amount of translation about this axis. Now, this is a scalar, d is not a vector, theta is not a vector. So, well the idea is very simple. You
Okay, so <clears throat> essentially we have two paths which are here, right? There is this path and then there is this path, okay? So you're just equating the two paths that you have to that point and then you take a dot product with W transpose. Now when you take a dot product with W transpose, um, now this W is the direct, is the direction vector for ZC. So, so this and we know that rho n is perpendicular to that. So dot product of rho n with W is 0. Okay, and similarly with uh, this m rho n, that's this is also a normal. So dot product with that is zero. So essentially, you get d is equal to w transpose n. Okay, and then after normalization, you can show that this is equal to um, this. You get these normalization factors like two sine theta. And then for rho n, you get this term one minus cos theta. This is all comes from the normalization and the fact that you're trying to make it normal. Okay. So this is the task. So I'm not giving the proof. So you can work it out fairly easily by working with this product. So let me quickly summarize the whole task now. So I want to now move from a general matrix in this initial matrix to this final form. This is a three by three. This is This is one by, three, 1 by 3 row of zeros. This is 1 and this is a 3 by 1. Okay, and this is a 3 by 1. So it's initial, final, capital, and capital. So you form your M as Q final into QI transpose. So what I've done, only thing difference which I'm making here is that I'm splitting it into two problems. I'm not multiplying by 4 by 4 matrices, I'm multiplying by 3 by 3 matrices. So this is compact computation. And you form this M matrix as QF minus. M times QI. So you're also transforming QI and then finding out what the displacement is. Now you just compute C theta as this. So you can find modulus of theta because there's uncertainty in theta. It could be plus or minus for this. You form this I matrix as vector as this. And you compute I transpose small m. Okay. Now then you find out what is the sign of the magnitude of I transpose M and with whatever is the magnitude, if it is positive, then you take the theta as negative. If the magnitude of this is negative, then you take the theta as positive. Okay, so this takes care of the sign of theta exactly. Then you form this W which is 1 upon 2 sin theta into this, ah, sorry, this is, I thought I would corrected all of these. That is why it is appearing as L, these are all L's. Oh, I think this does not have the font set. That's why it's uh, even the rows on the other page got messed up. This is interesting. You got to check on this. So we know theta ex explicitly. You compute W. Then from that you can find out D using this formula, and then finally find the rho, which is one minus m transpose m into two into one minus cosine of theta. So it's in the end it is fairly simple. Couple of matrix multiplications and vector matrix multiplications. And you can identify the axis and the full rotation. So what this allows you to do is in some way if you have a motion here and a motion here, so you can then coordinate. So there are two ways you can handle it, right? One way is that okay, you find out what only the Euler axis is, and then you chop up that rotation, you find out what the translation is, right? And then you chop that up in equal bit, and then at every step, at every step, you do that amount of translation, that amount of rotation, right? And then you concatenate those two matrices, and then you feed it into inverse kinematics. This gives you elegant method because it has this fixed axis about which you do your translation. 
So once you've identified that axis, the screw axis, then all you have to do is you have to chop up theta and then the translation is exact constant amount in that portion. So you can feed it in and you can recompute the matrix again over and over again. So it becomes simpler. Okay.